All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, and since, since uh, excitingly, we have, we have a couple new people today, so I'll introduce myself and for those watching on, uh, on, on recording. Um, hold on. Actually, time out. Does anyone know how to change your name on an iPad? Well, I mean, uh, so, so whoever just typed that, if you can tell me what you want your name to display as, I can just manually change you. That might be even faster. I know it's like the worst feeling when you want to rename yourself and you can't figure it out. Anyway, if you if you type that, then I can I can okay, sounds good. I can do that. All right, hang on a second. Let me do that. Then I'll start over. All right. So perfect. Excellent. All right. Hi. Um, so I'm Mel Hauser. I use she they pronouns, and I'm the executive director here at All Brains Belong Vermont. And we're very excited for today's Brain Club. Very excited for our special guest, Amanda Diekman, who's going to be, uh, uh, we're gonna be just talking about stress, energy, and demands, um, which is, you know, part of really uh, the, the big conversation we've been having all year about letting go of the brain rules that dictate so much of our daily existence um, that, are not doing anyone any favors um, and to try on a new approach. Um, and uh, for, for, for those of you who are new to Brain Club, just a little bit of introductions, ground rules. Um, all forms of participation are okay here. Um, as many of you have figured out already, uh, um, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we do not expect anything of you. Um, we certainly do not expect you to like look at the camera or sit still or whatever, move, walk, fidget, snack, have kids climbing all over you, pets, whatever. And all communication is okay here. You can unmute and shout it out. We do not like require you to raise your hand or whatever. Type in the chat box, gesture, use your emoticons, mix and match, whatever works for you. And just a word about language um, is that uh, you'll hear me and you know maybe maybe other people using identity first language um, when it, uh, for example, um, I am autistic and that is part of my identity. So that's that that's that's the way I use that word. Um, and some other people may use other phraseology, but just wanted to name that up front in case that's new for some folks. And um, another another part of you know why we why why we get into ground rules is that because safety comes first here. Um, we, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, we really want to respect and honor, protect one another's access needs. And we talk a lot about access needs here. Access needs being anything that any of us need to have full and meaningful participation. And so that includes um, that you're welcome to talk about anything you feel comfortable talking about at Brain Club. But we just ask that if it's something that you personally experienced as distressing or traumatizing, we just ask you to give a content warning with the topic so that everyone else can listen with informed consent versus um, take a break for a minute or two till that topic's over. And we'll always type in the chat box when that topic's over. Okay, before we get into our topic, I just wanna say that today, November 15th is ABB's first birthday and I'm really excited to spend it with you all. So um, we launched one year ago, whoa. And in our first year, uh, we've served 252 medical patients and our community programs, including Brain Club, have served 474 families and uh, provided 32-ish, I don't really, but it might be even a little bit more than that, neuro DEI trainings. So uh, not bad for a startup nonprofit. And when we talk about neuro DEI or neurocultural competency, I think Luna says it best. That's my Luna. Um, uh, Luna, who, by the way, like crashed a professional meeting today. Um, I wanna, and when I referenced her, she goes, that's me. It was amazing. Anyway, so, you know, uh, uh, one of my most recent, thank you, Carolyn. Um, um, uh, one of my most recent neurocultural competency training for a group of healthcare professionals, I said, hey, Luna, what do you want me to tell the people? 
and without missing a beat, she says, Mama, tell them there's no right way to be a person. That's my baby. So, and that's really what this year has been about. And I'm going to play two minute excerpt of a quick little video that, that, um, that we put together. We had a little, uh, little virtual birthday party uh, a few weeks ago with some of our volunteers. So I'm just gonna play two minutes of that. Happy birthday, ABB. Oops, that's not loud enough. I never quite figure out the motor plan of making it work. Okay. Happy birthday, ABB. A little over a year ago, an amazing human, Mel, told me about her dream, a place where everyone could come just as they are, a safe haven that would be full of magic. And together, we dreamed up the name, All Brains Belong. When you really think about it, All Brains Belong is a pretty radical idea. The idea that we would no longer make a distinction between healthcare and the rest of life where we would recognize that health and connection were not only related, but that connection and belonging were fundamentally required for health. Welcome to All Brains Belong, Vermont. It's a kind of an interesting place because it is a doctor's office, even though it doesn't really look like a doctor's office. And it's also where people can make friends who like the same stuff that they like. And um, I had exhaust, pretty much exhausted mainstream healthcare options, or at least the mainstream healthcare options I was willing to try. Um, mm -hmm. And I uh, heard this, I was sitting with this friend um, with over coffee, who was the director of the Vermont Disability Council, and she was raving about this new doctor in Montpelier who was out as autistic and starting a medical practice. Well, I knew how to be a doctor, but like, I did not know how to start a nonprofit, run a nonprofit, not a medical practice, but, um, but what I did know is that in order to make an impact and improve the lives of neurodivergent people, you had to change the world. So like to do anything for the neurodivergent community, you had to do everything. It's not just healthcare, it's, it's loneliness, it's school, it's work, it's everything. Cool. So I'll post the link in the chat if anybody wants to see the rest. Um, but I think the summary is that, you know, when we set out to think about how do we go about having people with all types of brains feel that we belong, it's really about not having any defaults. And um, uh, as, as, as you heard me say in that video, to do anything, we have to do everything because everything uh, is not is not working and it's about unlearning and reimagining what's possible and uh to that end oh come on there we go um to that end um our reimagining what's possible campaign launched yesterday it's already almost 50 you know, it's, it's already 50 percent done on day two um thanks to a very generous donor um uh we have a uh, opportunity to raise fifty thousand um, uh, dollars so donations through the end of the year um have doubled the impact and with that we're finally ready for today's topic so amanda deekman is a oops i'm letting in more people from the excited that there's more people coming um um, is a family coach and author of the soon to be released book, Low Demand Parenting. Um, Amanda is a, is a parent coach for families interested in a low demand life, a life where you drop demands to meet your kids and yourself with radical acceptance. And trust and joy are rediscovered this way, embracing this way of living and going low demand sets up an environment for people, families to thrive. And so what I'm going to do um, is um, Amanda and I pre-recorded a conversation. Um, this, this video is going to be so about 20 minutes and we'll keep the chat going so we can, we can be interacting this whole time. And then Amanda will be available for your questions. And hopefully we'll have, you know, we've got plenty of time, plenty of time for discussion. So here goes. 
Could you just did I click the button with the sharing of sound? Did that make noise? I don't trust myself. I'm gonna do it again. Yeah, okay. I always look to Laura Lewis to tell me if uh, if, if if technology's working. It's kind of your role. All right, reshare, share sound. All right, here we go. Could you describe um, for Brain Club participants who have who who are not familiar with like the paradigm of low demand, low demand parenting? Like, can you describe the 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 framework to introduce everything else we've talked about? Sure. Yeah. Low demand parenting is an approach instead of a set of things to do. It's a heart system as much as it is, is a brain system. And it's an approach that reduces expectations and drops demands in order to create a trusting and connected relationship with your child. And the amazing thing about it is that this approach will change your life because we all have little children inside of us who weren't parented exactly the way we needed. And by actively creating trust and connection with your real life children, you create space to have a trusting relationship with your inner child, with your adults in your life. And it enables you to really show up in the world in a wholehearted way. So I, I do say like, be careful dipping your toes in this because it's going to change your life. <laughs> it's, um, it's a lifestyle as well. Like low demand is about the rhythms of communication um, that can be with or without words. It's, it's a flow back and forth of listening to your child and especially their behavioral expressions what, of telling you when something is too hard over here. I cannot and then hear you. honoring too hard by dropping oh, your all your food in you that moment. And then Do you eat both bars? And thinking ahead, well, how can I drop this demand proactively so that instead of expecting that my child will be able to put on their own shoes, I am actively accommodating by putting on the shoes for them without ever mentioning, hey, it's time for you to put on your shoes. So it's a proactive approach as much as it is a responsive one, even though it happens in this flow of communication. And it's also a method of getting your own needs met. So as you drop demands, how can I get my needs met without issuing any demands of the people in my life? Which is actually so empowering because it turns out that we really can meet our own needs without expecting anything of anyone else. And so much of parenting is getting our needs met through our kids. So I need you to come when I call you at the playground because I want this other parent to think I'm a good parent and have an obedient child. Well, I'm a good parent, but I don't have an obedient child and I can meet my own needs to feel like a good parent and without ever expecting you to come when I call. And that is also a transformative move because it kind of completes the cycle. It allows us to drop demands without it hurting us and without everything falling back on our shoulders. We get to meet our own needs and that enables us to show up for our children in this trusting connected relationship. <laughs> so much, so much. Um, you know, it's interesting. Like I think a year ago, having this like like, like i i would imagine that you know like uh, many people hearing this for the first time who are in the midst of chaos like chaos like this is me a year ago like scrolling through social media and like seeing the instagram reels of all the people being like so like this is here how you feel happily ever after and here you here you feel joyful and connected and you're like joyful and connected in my parents do you not understand the chaos that i'm in like, 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 how do you connect when you're so dysregulated and there's such a gap between your expectations of your life and reality and like zooming out, like now I can see like, that's the problem. That's the problem mm -hmm. is like your expectations are the problem. Um, but like when you're in it, you can't have access to your cortex to see that. So yeah. like, is, is, is it just about like starting with figuring out what your own needs are like, like in, in, in bite-sized chunks, like where, how does somebody start when they're so dysregulated as a parent? 
Yeah, I would always, this is always what I say, start with the popsicle. So your kid wants to eat a popsicle and it's 4.30 and you're making dinner and you want to say, no, you can't have a popsicle because I'm making dinner. Start by saying yes to the popsicle and giving that little bit of freedom and control to your child and then recognizing, oh, okay, my fear is that then you're not going to eat dinner and my spouse is going to say, why aren't they eating? And it's, you know, blah, 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 blah. But just start with one yes, one yes to a popsicle and notice your reaction, your fear and ah comes up, but also Look at your child's face when you say yes to the popsicle and just see, is there delight there? Is there surprise? Is there connection on their face? And, you know, joy and ease and all of that doesn't have to be macro. It can be in this one moment. I get to give you a gift of a popsicle and you look at me like I am the single greatest parent on the face of the earth. And I smile back like, hell yeah, I am. And then we move forward and that one connection point can grow into so much more. It could be, so I always say start with the pop school, but it could also be the shoes. Start with the shoes, bring them over, put them on those little feet and then walk out the door without ever having battled and just see how you feel with one battle down one thing that you are not in opposition and see if it can grow from there. Oh, that's amazing. I think that seems <laughs> like that feels like maybe something that's like maybe doable, you know, in, 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 uh, yeah. So Luna and I have been discussing power lately because mm -hmm. like, she's five and she, what's modeled for her, like in video games or cartoons is like power over people. Mm -hmm. And like power over people feels gross to me as a PDA or like, I don't want people, I don't want power over me. And I don't want to have power over people because it's gross. So like yeah. we watch a lot of My Little Pony where like the messages are that the people seeking power over, they never prosper. It's the power of friendship, the power of connection, the power of co-regulation, which is like, you know, like, um, like a reciprocal power. Like, it's just anyway. So like, we've been talking about like, just like the different kinds of power and where do we get power? Because I feel like the like transformation from like, you know, like the traumatic transformation toward narcissism, because like, yeah. I mean, you can start off as, you know, like, you know, for, for, you're like a little kid and everyone has power over you and you like seek out to have power over, like you don't have power, you seek your power, you want to claim your power. And like, if you only know about power over, you go down that train, right? And like, if you don't have connection, like, ah, anyway, like, what do you think about this as a concept? <laughs> Yeah, I think it really aligns too with the role of punishment in relationships and how power over that the main leverage that you get if you have power over somebody is both controlling them and punishing them. And I think that like uh, manipulating their behavior towards your good and if they aren't aligned with that, then they deserve to be hurt for their transgression. and you know, that's our world. Like we, we let, literally live in systems built on that. Yes. And for our kids, they're, they're trying to make sense of what happens when something is transgressed. Like, what do we, what do we do when a line is broken or um, like within the trust, like trust gets broken or connection gets severed and we make mistakes basically. And so in a power over relationship, what happens around mistakes? Well, mistakes are punished and in a power with or a power like in a co-regulation relationship where I mean, power doesn't even, the power is in the connection. Right, totally. And because I feel like, I'm like, I'm even hearing 
language from my five-year-old, like, like a thing that comes out a lot when like I make a mistake and then she'll say something like, you know, so like she might like, you know, and she'll be like, that's what you get for X. And I'm like, where, where did you get? I like, like, I mean, there's like a lot of things she says and I'm like, damn it, that came from me. But like, I don't say that. That one doesn't come out. Maybe I think it, or like maybe yeah. I I don't know I don't even know like is it TV is it I have no idea I have no idea what, like my husband or the, like I have no idea like if somebody actually says that but like I think mm-hmm. that it's just the narrative constructed from observations of the world that's what you get for X as opposed to like you know like um uh, we have a, 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 a pediatric occupational therapist on our board who I like would love for you to meet um, Hannah Bloom who um, she talks a lot about the, the the cycle of repair and like you know so like you know we're all gonna transgress we're all gonna make mistakes but like it's the repair that closes that loop and you know like most of us grew up in a world where there was no repair, you know, just like, you know, punish, 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 you know, flip your lid, which is, you know, normal to flip your lid, but like, you know, no repair. Yeah, absolutely. And the repair with yourself is what I see, especially for my kids that they're externalizing like that's what you get for is what they say to themselves too like when they make a mistake then they're saying well of course your grown-up is going to ignore you or yell at you because that's what you get you you messed up and this sense that they deserve punishment is really hard to repair because our world is reinforcing that. And so it's kind of like, that's the cosmic repair work is repairing that relationship with yourself where you have the capacity to say, I'm a person who makes mistakes. And I'm also a person who knows how to make things right. That's our family language is we all make mistakes, but we know how to make it right. And that helps us to keep coming back to repair rather than choosing what's kind of an easier path. Like, Punishment and isolation is, it's the dominant narrative to step outside that is what's hard. Because like, (laughs) I think a lot of people who have grown up in a paradigm of like, you do the thing when the people with power over tell you to do the thing. And like, when, when like zoomed out to be like, do you see how that's setting people up for like bad, dangerous things? And they're like, oh, oh. No, I never thought about that. Now I thought about that. I'm like, ah! Yes, and that brings up um, something from the parent's perspective that I think is really important. Something I call the fake drop. When you fake drop a demand with your kid, it's when you you say that you're okay with something like, sure, you can eat yogurt on your bed, but your energy doesn't match it. Your energy is like, ooh, that right there is one of the most important things that we can do is being aware of our own fake drops. And I'll give an example of how I shifted and how important it is for this long-term stuff. So at bedtime, my oldest, he doesn't like to be touched just generally. He doesn't like any kind of tactile sensation. And I would always like every night I wanted to hug and kiss him because in my mind, that's the end of our bedtime routine. And we feel close and I get to like smell his hair and So I have all of these fantasies of getting to do that. And every night I would fake drop to the demand. I didn't actually touch him, but I didn't, I didn't feel good about it. And I would walk away like, oh, what kind of kid is going to grow up? Like, will he ever be able to be touched? And what will his partner, future partners do? And all these like big worries. And then I realized that I could flip it around and instead ask, what am I teaching him? What gift am I giving him by dropping this demand? And I realized, oh, I'm t- I'm teaching him that he always gets to choose how he will be touched and that people who love and respect him will respect his boundaries and that he gets to feel safe in an intimate relationship and that his preferences matter just as much as mine. And now when I leave his bed, I'm so confident in the gift I'm giving him by not hugging and kissing him, that my energy matches the demand drop. And and that 
can, that opens up all of this trust and connection and it empowers him to go out into the world and advocate for himself because he knows what it feels like to be safe in a low demand relationship. That is huge. Um, in, 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 in my house, um, uh, uh, we have this, um, uh, Luna came up with this. Um, so we, we know someone who has a cat named pumpkin and it was described to Luna that pumpkin does not like to be snuggled. And mm. that when pumpkin's feeling safe, pumpkin will initiate snuggle. Um, and so Luna will make the observation of like when her boundaries are respected and she feels safe, she will pumpkin and Luna pumpkins often like in the morning, um, she'll just like, she'll snuggle up and she'll be like, I am pumpkin. And like, it, it just, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's everything, but like, it's, it's like letting go. It's like, it's, it's totally the fake drop. It like had to start from like a zooming out strategy. You're being manipulative, mom. Like that, that was the fake drop um, until like, really like, yeah, I love the idea of reframing everything as the gift that you are giving. Can you tell us like, how do we find you? How do we connect with where you are? And you're like, tell us about like the things that, that you offer to the community and how people can connect with you. Yeah, fantastic. The main place I hang out online is on Instagram at low demand Amanda, um, which is my favorite saying out loud is so great. When I was a little kid, I was Amanda Panda and low demand Amanda just kind of slides right in there. Um, and so I loved Instagram as a two way street. So it would be a real joy for me if somebody who was here on Brain Club reached out and said, I saw you and I thought this and I had this question, that would be a super joy. So um, please do that. And um, while I'm hanging out on Instagram, one of the things that I do is a low demand day in the life. So every week I throw open the curtain and say, this is what we do. And I, yes, I really do have no screen time boundaries with my kids. They get to use it however much they want to. And here's what it looks like. And yes, they really do eat all over the house. And here's how I manage that. So you can um, kind of see low demand in motion there. And then if people are interested in like in digging in and taking on more in a bite-sized kind of way, there are also um, two courses that you can take. One is like a single class and the other are little bitty videos and worksheets and good for people who like to do their own work and their own pace. Um, and you can find links to all of that through my website, which is amandadeekman.net. And then the last thing is that if you're watching this way later, and maybe it's 2023, you could be looking for my book to come out called Low Demand Parenting, and it's going to be published in the summer of 2023. Congratulations! That is so Thank amazing. You. So amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that you want to say to bring club folks before I stop recording? I just want to say thank you for showing up and for all the ways that you are caring for your own sensitive brain, body, and, and self in the world. It's so important. I really believe that the way that we're caring for ourselves and transforming our relationships with our kids, that it truly is world changing. And for all the future generations who are gifted, from these little daily gifts you're giving your child. Um, I hope you stand tall in your choices today and um, feel really brave. Many of the, you know, different uh, interactions that we have at all brings along, it's really like, like, like imagining the world you wish to see and just like doing it. And you're like, you have to unlearn so much, but like, you want it to be so just try it and like it, it it it's it's very much like starting with the popsicle mm -hmm. um and 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 it, yeah and like so much of like so so we have a lot of conversations about access needs and mm -hmm. neg and, and acknowledging that you get to have needs you get to have you know, like access needs, you know, anything that you need to meaningfully and fully show up in your life. And 
acknowledging that we are always going to have conflicting access needs. And I, uh, this paradigm of low demand parenting, I think is a, a paradigm that allows, allows for conflicting access needs. Um, but what I've heard from you that I have not previously considered is the idea that some uh, when, when we think about access needs as a whole, it's like, what do I need from the environment that allows me to show up? And what you're saying is to try, on, I, I think what I'm hearing from you is like, maybe we can try on the idea that some of our access needs can be met without the people in the environment necessarily making any changes to afford that is that what you're saying i i think so when you get down into the real details of the situation yeah i think we can it the needs may need to be met by other people but we get to be creative about who we entrust with our needs and it doesn't have to be the the person in the world says oh yeah you know if you need to process your 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 day should be with your partner well no maybe there's a friend who's your process person at the end of the day because they can hold that need in a way that your partner can't the need is valid and the bringing it out into the world is is crucial and then you're creative about the who and yeah our access needs get to conflict they get to be confusing and and they get to be um varying from moment to moment and what we show up to them with our creative hats on to see how can we get them met. Wow. Oh my goodness, Amanda. So I'd love to hear from, from the audience around like how this how this message is landing, whether or not you're a parent, just like the idea of reframing so much of this, uh, of, 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 of the gifts of dropping the demands. Reading in the chat, um, Carolyn says, I don't have kids, but I like reading about and watching content about gentle parenting. That and now Amanda's approach bring me joy and hope. So heartwarming. Yeah, and like it's so much about like so much of these, um, what we can think about. And, and, and Amanda said this, I think, at the beginning of the interview around this is so much about your relationship to yourself. And I think that there's, you know, when 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 you've grown up in a paradigm that is not this, it's just so much on learning to do. Hi, Carly, go for it. Okay, so I'm coming from a more experienced place, yet feeling like a more newbie than ever. Um, so I went to the TDI Connections meeting this week, and that's where I saw Mel. And I'm actually um, an experienced special ed teacher. I've worked with gifted students as well because I've taught in states that have gifted programs. And um, my son uh, turned out to be one of those kids. And I, um, it wasn't until I, so I left education quite a few years ago and came back. And um, in the meantime, there was this PDA thing that has, come about and um yeah so this whole thing with the low demand lifestyle I had to turn my camera off because I was not comfortable with just pouring out tears not because I have to take that very first step to let my kid have the popsicle because since he was born his sugar has been in the bottom cupboard where he could decide whether he wanted it or not that's just my natural way of parenting influenced by my incredible training in special ed but I have been making all of these accommodations that have been ma masking some of his issues. And then as he goes out into, yes, cried too, yeah. And so as he's gone out into the world, all of a sudden this perfectly behaved kid is 
we're we're running into some really really big problems and for me it isn't so much as the encouragement to let go of those things as it has been tonight feeling like I have been doing the right thing and screw everyone else and that's just all I have to say okay thank you Absolutely. You know, it's nothing you did wrong. You did everything right. And intuitively, like I think a lot of this is about reconnecting with your intuition because when society keeps being like, do the thing and you're like, but, 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 and you're like, you cortically override to do the thing as a parent. And then like, as soon as you're like, oh, oh, now I can do the, I can, I, I can, I can, I can parent intuitively. Like what? Ah, I'm so glad you're here. Mia, go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was saying that in the in the chat that so often when we have conflicting access needs, so many of us are told we can't have them met because other people's needs matter more than ours. And I know that as a child, a lot of people would say to me, oh, you just need to think about other people's feelings. Or, and I like think, well, that would be all well and good if it was two way, but it's like they had more power and it goes back to what, you, what was being said about um, people who have power over us. It's like they can do like, like what I find is that I might think that something's wrong, but it's like, Sometimes we're, we're uh, not we're not in a position to stop people transgressing against us and like and our boundaries. But um, but yeah, um, but yeah, this has. Um, I guess I'm thinking about it because uh, at the moment. Yesterday I received some news regarding what I was say what I've said about how about the hate campaign I got for trying to get my needs met uh, with the airport. But um, but what I found was that yesterday I got the news that uh, that um, my uh, paper is being published in the British Journal for Social Work. And this is an issue that I've been silenced on so much because people have like tried to tell me that, oh, your needs are not that important or other people's needs are greater. Like the need for security is more important than your need for personal, um, for bodily autonomy. And right, right. it feels like now somebody's willing to listen to me. Well, that's, um, you know, congratulations, Mia. That's thanks. huge, right? And it's, and, 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 you know, the whole journey, right? And so it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a journey for so many people of, of, of unlearning those over rehearsed neural pathways that, that say you don't get to have needs, you don't get to have autonomy, your needs don't matter. Um, and, and, you know, all of the, all of the downstream consequences of that. So just, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Any questions for Amanda? Or anything, Amanda, and as, 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 as uh, you know, as, as you, oh, hold, Laura, go for it. I didn't even actually form my thought yet, so it's perfect. Go for it. Sorry, I'm cutting you off now. That's Amanda. I that was so helpful to hear, and you can hear our house right now is rocking. But um, the blog post that I just was like, told that one got me emotional. Was how do we do this and prepare our children for the real world? And I feel like you've addressed that concern of mine in this blog post. But I just love to hear you speak more about that because I feel like it's it, to Carly's concern. It's like you can control in some ways a, a home environment and then you send them into the world where you don't have control and and what do you how do you prepare them for that environment while still setting them up to have a safe home 
Yeah, it's a great, it's a really common question. It's, it's an important question. And it, I think it points to so much of what makes um, the low demand preparation. And I, I've met, told Mel, I'm a solo parent of three. You're welcome to join. Come on in um, tonight. Not always, but tonight I am. Um, so first of all, when I'm thinking about the real world, I always want to question now what is real about that world that I want to affirm in my own family that I want to create and recreate every day in our environment? Are there parts about the real world that I never want to bring into my home? And the answer is yes. Hold on. Yes, Lucky. Oh, yes. You don't know how to unlock that? I don't know how to do it. I don't know either. Anybody know how to unlock the skate park? It's not clicking. Um, I don't know. But I really don't power know. off and restart. Ooh, power off and restart. Can okay. you? Can I don't know. I'm making that up. I actually have no idea. I flip my lid when my technology doesn't work. <laughs> well, he's handling it well. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> and if there are parts of the real world that I actively want to resist in my home, then I am also creating people who know how to resist it when they experience that reality in the world. So a big part of the reality of the world is this um, very harsh view of cause and effect, that if you transgress, then you deserve punishment. And we all know that that system is horribly broken. And yet so many of us recreated in our household, like we can toughen up our kids so that when they experience it in the world, they'll be okay. But how many of us got toughened up as kids and we were not okay? We actually needed to go through this whole process of unlearning as adults about how to be open and how to be gentle and how to be soft and how to let down our protections that, that we learned so young in order to protect ourselves from, from the ways that we were parented. One more second, or else I'm gonna lose my thought, okay. Um, and then the last thing is that really my motivation in creating little people who know how to resist the real world is also that I want to change the world in my parenting, that I actively think that parenting in a revolutionary way is an act of faith in a future that we don't see yet that we can be radical parents in our tiny little world, remaking everything. And we make people who are gonna get out there and just blow the whole thing up. And that's what I want more than anything. <laughs> okay, now I'm gonna mute and help, help this very patient little person. Amazing, amazing, exactly. Um, yes. Nia. Yeah. Uh... As um, like I've been in quite a few unschooling groups uh, over the years, because although I don't have children, I've always felt very strongly that that is the way forward and that would have been what would have helped me. And one thing that I've come across is a lot of people have said, people talk about the real world and what exactly, what, so, so is the real world having, uh, like sitting sitting in uh in uh in a room in a, in a rows of uh desks sort of thing and like is that really the real world uh and i think a lot of it does go to what exactly is the real world and um but yeah it's like uh it's like the real world is what pe what people with the most power have de decided it is, and uh, and I think um, and of course when COVID happened, a lot of that was had to change. Yeah, and so you know, like you know, the the uh, who defines reality you know who defines what is the real world it's um you know it's 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 back to power over and when we really think about how as human beings we're all wired for connection and co-regulation and it's that quote the real world 
is about overriding and disrupting that natural drive for for co-regulation. Hey, Stacy, go for it. Hi. Um, so I have to go all fangirl on you, Amanda. Like you are just one of our favorite people in our home and a daily inspiration for like how we can do better by our kid. Um, and also for people that might be like having the midlife, I think I'm autistic crisis um, as well in their 30s. So um, thank you for just being you and putting yourself out there and being so vulnerable and allowing other people to benefit from that vulnerability. Um, I just, this conversation reminded me of what I was listening to on my drive home. Um, it's a book called Neuro Tribes, and it just talks about how in like the 80s, um, you know, the, the mindset was that it's just much easier to change the behavior of the child to then to address the stigmas of society when it came to like neurodivergent behaviors and neurodivergent individuals. And I just think it's super cool, like Brain Club and all that you are doing here is like trying, like you're taking on society instead of focusing on changing the child. And that's just a real 180. Um, it's a heavy lift, but it's just like, I was in a conference today, um, this morning for like insurance. And this woman had just gotten back from a big conference in San Francisco and the best talk she attended in the four day back to back to back was about neuro inclusion in the workplace. And I'm like, this is cool. Like, this is what I want to hear more of. Um, so it's just exciting and kind of to echo the sentiments in the chat to be a part of all of this, like world changers for sure. Oh, Stacey, that's amazing. Right. I mean, so I think the thing is, you know, whether, you know, when we really kind of think about the defaults of all the major systems, they're clearly not working, right? Like, so, you know, not only, you know, the healthcare system, you know, like not working for like most people, not just even, not just neurodivergent people. Employment, think about all the open positions, like em employers across so many different industries can't recruit people or keep people in jobs because people don't want them because they're so, like, like there's, it's not the person, it's the environment, right? Like, but, when you know when 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 you just assume that the real world this is how this is and it's a foregone conclusion that it's all going to be terrible why um but you know i i grew up, I, I i was the kid that you know i remember my you know i i often got the message of like get a grip on reality you don't have a grip on reality and i think that was my pda of like it's not a like, it's not that I don't understand reality. It's that I refuse to accept it because it's terrible. So yeah, I agree. I think that there's a piece of suffering in each of us yes. from reality. Oh, um, the, the reality that we were told is reality. And then a part of us when we were little that believed in a different world, that believed that our reality mattered too, and that our inner selves were inherently right, and that there was some sacred worth there, that Mom. we were told, oh no, that's not reality. You know, your dreams aren't real. And so we shut it down. And um, part of this what I see yeah. with, in low demand parents, yes, Bubby, just mm -hmm. a second. Oh yeah, we're gonna put it on. We're gonna put it on. Is that there's a child likeness that can be a, a kind of a reconnection with the little part of our Stop it. <laughs> that um that shut it down a long time ago. Stop. And that we can kind of bring that dream back to life again. Amen to that. Carly. I think just to add another layer to this idea about how difficult our reality is, is I don't know if you had a chance, Mel, to read the paper that Trevor Tebbs sent out to all of us, but like his basic message is that um, while we are squashing these neurodivergent minds, we are giving up an opportunity to save the world. So there's a whole nother level to what you're doing here. 
That's it. I, you know, reframing it that way is really, really important, right? So when you are sending, when you're, when you send the message of, you know, this deficit based message about being broken and defective, like, guess what? That impacts development. Guess what? That impacts everything. Guess, I mean, just it's, it, it, it's everything. Um, is a, is a question in the chat. Um, Amanda, I'm brand new to your work. I love what I'm hearing. I'm curious to hear more about how Wait, low demand is... parenting and boundaries interact. For example, my PDA son considers toothbrushing a major unpleasant demand. This is something I'm not willing to compromise on. Can you talk about this? I would love to. But first of all, my youngest has something he would like to say. He has been I raising his snap. hand. Yes. Do you want to show off your snapping? Wow. It's so amazing. I, that, you know, it, it's, it's really cool that you practiced to, to make, to make that happen. I didn't learn how to snap till I was like 32. And sometimes I can't even snap. I, I lose it sometimes. So that's amazing. Wow. So low demand and boundaries. I would say this is probably my second most um, common question outside of like preparing them for the real world. So this is great. Um, so before I get to the toothbrushing question, which is um, a really helpful example, toothbrushing, um, boundaries, okay. the first place that I teach boundaries is teaching my kids to know their own boundaries, to know the line between what's hard and what's too hard. And by teaching them to, to find their own boundaries, I teach them how to honor Mom, what a boundary is and Mom, what it feels like. What's this? That's a light because it's dark in here. I don't like it. Yeah, you can play with it. Um, the like this. the Mom, the I trick my with teaching the concept. Mom, I have it. I have They're gonna have a hard time hearing. Saying. One more thing you want to say? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then they're gonna have a hard time hearing my voice over okay. yours. So why don't you talk? No, you talk first, and then I'll talk second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Mom, no. You're... First. Me talk first. Okay, then you can talk second. Um, when, oh, brain <laughs> boundaries. Teaching boundaries like to know boundaries. like your your boundaries. Yes, and, yeah. teaching them the difference. Teaching them that line between hard. When something is hard, we're brave. We can do hard things. When something is too hard, we drop the bound. We drop the expectation. I knew you were gonna see that, so I dropped your hand. <laughs> Thank you. It was a dramatic illustration of the dropped boundary. Um, so we drop the demands and we find other ways to get our core needs met. And as soon, when kids learn that, that I, and for my kids, they know that when something is too hard, we always let it go. And so if I say, hey guys, this is too hard for me, then they understand, oh, then we need to let it go Mom, because there, it's too hard. To say. I know they oh they have something they need to say. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're worried about you, Mia, but but we're gonna come back to you. We see your hand. Okay. No, um, no, it's great. Okay, it's great. awesome. For toothbrushing, this is the crazy thing about demands is that they are actually cumulative in our system. We were just talking about this. Uh, I was talking about this with a client today that we have a certain number of push throughs in our system. A certain the, number of that we just left. We are, oh, so left. left. Oh, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Remember there, if we're, if we're both talking at the same time, our voices are going to get mixed up. So right now it's just me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when, when we're brushing teeth and saying, this is a top priority is brushing teeth is a top priority. Then you want to drop as many other demands as you can surrounding the brush teeth experience. So every single tiny demand that has to do with brushing teeth and truly in your day so that the cumulative system is ready to hit this top priority with the full strength. And so if you've already given away all of your push throughs in the day, you're not going to have anything left to get up to something that's really, really hard, right on that line between hard and too hard and say, I can do this. I can get through to the other this. side. So if you've already used it, like, like this. that's lip gloss. Um, if you've already, oh, wow. let's say you, I have a hard time brushing my teeth. This is me. If I've already used my push throughs on, um, 
like having my body touched a lot, Mom, doing the dishes Mom, and I'm almost done. Um, then I get to brushing teeth time and I'm like, I don't have it in me. I can't do it tonight. And I don't do it. It's the same for our kids. If we can honor as many of their boundaries as possible, then when it gets to time to brush teeth, they're going to have more there to honor that this is a top priority and to, to go as far as they can. And it's just a core principle that kids always do well when they can. So it's really just a way of saying, set them up to do well. Okay. What do you have to say? Okay. We're going to have a a phone tree. Okay, um, he made a homemade stuffy and he's gonna go get it and show you guys in a little bit. Yeah. No, right now. Oh, right now, okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Linda's gonna love it so much. Yeah. Mia. Yeah, I was thinking about how um, a lot of people would say to to me that I when when I don't just listen to them, uh, when I don't just uh, ignore my own boundaries or whatever, that I don't care about other people. Because what I find is over the years, I've found myself not caring about their needs, but that's basically been because they don't care about mine. And it's like, when I think of how my mental health is affected, I found myself thinking, why should I care about a society that doesn't care about me? And and yet, when people sort of meet me halfway, I'm happy to meet them halfway. Like when I went to the airport um, and had uh, they spoke about reasonable adjustments, and they were quite clear about what their boundaries were and what they couldn't couldn't do and even though they were quite um clear about what what their boundaries were it's like I felt sort of this thing about going through that scanner was was what would be considered too hard for me and it's like that was one thing that was like too hard whereas having the conversation was hard but it got easier when, but it's like, it got easier as we talk, but it's like, um, for me, it's like, I was always okay to negotiate, but I think what I struggled with was this very, for years, sort of, there was this non-negotiable way of thinking that, oh, you're the one who needs to change your attitude. You need to take therapy. And I found myself just, because it felt so many people felt like that, I felt like the whole of society thought of that or much of it. And I found myself not caring about society when they did that. So I actually feel apart from anything else, they, these people, they actually do a lot of damage to themselves because they alienate people like myself from them whereas actually if they'd been more willing to engage with me I'd have been much more willing to engage with them and I'd have been able to do more for them and yes absolutely thank you for sharing that I think that there's so many people for whom that's true right because when you when your when your access needs are not met, that is when you don't. I mean, safety comes first for everybody, and when your limbic system does not feel safe, you are not going to have bandwidth, spoons, whatever you want to think about it, to be like perspective taking and like you know, you you don't have resources available to be like 
thinking about other people's needs. You're just trying to restore safety. Hey, is there a stuffy? No, that's okay, it's cool. Um, any other time, if you ever want to, I'd be like, love to see it because I love stuffies. Okay, <laughs> so- I actually yeah. need to um, bow out and- yeah, yeah. Um, I just heard something I, really important from this one. Okay. No, 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 no. no, I think it would be actually really helpful for all of these other grownups to hear the really big truth you just had. He said, I'm starting, can you stop doing this? I'm starting to feel like you don't care about me. And I, that is such an important wisdom that I just wanted to tell you that this is why I'm leaving is because it's starting to feel like I don't care about him. And that is, I always tell people in all my meetings that my kids are my top priority and that I would rather compromise another adult than compromise their connection to me. So I'm just letting you know why I'm bowing out. Um, and thank you for all the love. It's been such an honor to be with you guys tonight. And I really meant it in the video that it would be a, a real gift if you would send me a message on Instagram and say hi and let me know that you were here and that you're part of All Brains Belong. Um, I will tell them thank you. Yeah, there's a message in the chat to thank my kids for sharing me. Yeah, they're pretty generous, um, but they they notice. And <laughs> um, actually, I think that my middle one just called the little guy away for a second to give me a chance to say goodbye to you guys. Um, but something that I talk about with my kids a lot is that... Um, I learned all of this by listening really deeply to them, that they were my wake up call. And I didn't know about the impact of demands on my own life until my kids got really brave and really bold about sharing with me that things were not okay and that the path that we were on was not okay with them. And so I just want to share that, that I really do owe so much wisdom and learning in my life to my kids being willing and they weren't always willing to do it in the nicest way like I don't want to paint a really beautiful picture it was it was breakdown it was burnout it was extreme beh behavior but that was bravery too and sometimes we gotta get loud with the people in our life to let them know yeah I know that's what we have to say sometimes. So I do care about you. And I'm saying goodbye to these friends so that we can spend time together. Okay. Okay. All right. Good night, y'all. Thank you so Good much. Night. Thank you. And thank you all, everyone yeah. for here. And um, uh, uh, we build on this conversation about reimagining. Um, next week, we're going to be talking. It's, uh, it's, it's time for our monthly discussion of reimagining employment. Um, and we're going to have a, a I, I, I think it's going to be an asynchronous conversation um, with, with Jesse Bridges from United Way Northwest of Vermont. And um, we'll be um, continuing reimagining and creating the world we wish to see. So thank you all so much for being here and I hope you have a great week. Bye.